If you look at the map of the world GDP per capita today, you'll see great disparities. And you might ask yourself, well, how is that so? And that's even more surprising if you know history, as I do a little bit, and you go back in history at the historical graph of the world GDP, which is the one you see on the screen right now. And if you go back to say 15, 1600, as a share of the world economy, uh, places that are now dominant, like Europe and North America, used to be far smaller. What were the areas of the world that represented a majority of the world GDP? Uh, were the Middle East in general, roughly 10% of the world GDP, and then India, uh, and then China, uh, altogether representing something like 60 or 70% of the world GDP. And yet somehow these countries, over the next few hundred years, did not come to colonize the world or dominate it. Uh, what happened? Uh, that's the question we're going to try to answer in the next few videos. What went wrong? If you have such a thing as the rise of the West, the rise of countries like England to world predominance, how come you have a non-rise of the non-West? If you want to solve the mystery of why some non-Western countries did not end up dominating the world, you could start with Muslim empires, and that's what we'll do today. We have a couple other videos about China and then Japan. By Muslim empires, uh, I mean for the early modern era, uh, places like the Ottoman Empire in Turkey, the Safavid Empire in Persia, and the Mughal Empire in India. Those empires, as of say the year 15-1600s, uh, would have been able to build upon a long and proud tradition of Muslim dominance, uh, going all the way back to the Middle Ages, in fact. Uh, in Europe, when you look at the Middle Ages, you tend to think of uh, dirty castles, uh, people burnt at the stake, uh, generally a, a time of retraction compared with the glories that was ancient Greece and Rome, at least until the days of the Renaissance. Uh, for the Muslims, the area of the Middle Ages would be more seen as a golden age. Uh, for one thing, if you're a devout Muslim, that's when your religion appeared uh, in the uh, 600s under uh, the instigation of the Prophet Muhammad. That's when that religion that eventually grew into the second largest in the world uh, was born. And the Middle Ages is when you have great Muslim thinkers for algebra, and that's how we get a Muslim name for it, uh, mass, and that's how we get Arabic numerals. Astronomy, and that's why you have stars in the sky that are that have named like uh, Beetlejuice or Aldebaran, and generally uh, poetry and so forth. Uh, one of these great Muslim scholars lived in Spain. His name was Abbe Ruiz, and he's more of a philosopher slash translator who studied a lot of the ancient texts from Greece, uh, great philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, and so forth, and who by that point had been pretty much forgotten in Western Europe read them, annotated them, translated them, and kind of reintroduced them to Spain and ultimately Europe in a way that eventually helped spark the Renaissance. So all the ideas that could help spark a Renaissance in the Arab world are also there. Another way to measure how great a civilization is beyond the world of ideas would be by how militarily powerful they are. And there the uh, Muslim world was quite powerful for a long time, uh, starting in the days of Muhammad, who was not just a religious leader, but also a military leader, uh, waging a jihad against the infidels. Uh, the Arabs expanded from uh, the Arabian Peninsula to conquer all the Middle East, North Africa, occupied parts of Spain for 700 years, and then pushed into Central Asia all the way to the edge of India and uh, China. And we'll see later on in the Ottoman Empire, uh, expanded even further than that. Uh, so militarily powerful. How else do you measure civilizations? By how much imprint they left uh, in the ground uh, through architecture. And you have quite a few uh, magnificent remnants of uh, Muslim architecture for the Middle Ages, even as far away as Spain, which, as I mentioned, uh, left, lived under Muslim occupation for a long time. You go to southern areas like Andalusia, Seville, Granada, and you have beautiful monuments like uh, the mosque at Cordoba or the palace of the Alhambra in, uh, that's in Granada. Another thing that might play a role uh, in the long run if your area of the world is going to dominate is how, you good, how good you are at exploration. And there again, the Muslim world, that's some of the early explorers. You've all heard of Marco Polo, uh, who traveled on foot uh, from his native Venice all the way to China and then back. Well, around the same time, which would be the days of you know, the Mongols and Kublai Khan, you have another very similar explorer, this time Muslim, who came from Morocco. Uh, who traveled pretty much everywhere Marco Polo went and then beyond, 
uh, because he also visited the kingdom of Mali in West Africa, uh, the whole coast of North Africa, did the pilgrimage uh, to Mecca, which is uh, did a little side trip to the east coast of Africa along the Indian Ocean, and then the whole Silk Road, Central Asia uh, route that Marco Polo followed, and also uh, went all the way to uh, China and did a little detour through the Maldives uh, as well. What else could make a civilization rich? Well, commerce as well, or trade, or wealth in general. In that regard, the Muslim Middle East had a very interesting spot in that they were smack in the Middle Asia, at the spot where Europe, Africa, and Asia connect, and that made them a, an emporium uh, to the world. All the products from East Asia, whether it's textiles like silk or spices, uh, would travel along the Silk Road, and that's always good. You're buying products from one side, uh, say India and China, transport it, jack up the price, and sell it to Italians on the other side. Uh, that's what, say, the Prophet Muhammad did. Uh, his day job was being a, a merchant. So that made that area of the world quite uh, significant in uh, world production, and that shows up in those GDP figures, I showed you. So clearly there's a lot of uh, uh, tradition to build upon, and if you had looked at the world in 1500, you would say, well, maybe that's the area of the world that's going to explore everywhere, uh, conquer places, and they'll be the one to set up a Muslim empire in Mexico or Peru. And yet they did not. So what happened that would explain why an area of the world like the Middle East that seemed poised to conquer the world did not? Well, in the early modern era, you have three main empires that are Muslim in the Middle East uh, defined widely. Uh, to the west, the Ottoman Empire, to the middle, the Safavid Empire uh, in Persia, and to the east, the Mughal Empire of India. And I'll focus on uh, the Mughals and the Ottomans, starting with the Ottomans. Also known sometimes as the uh, Turkish Empire because these people are Turks. And people often make a distinct, uh, fail to make a distinction between Arab and Muslim. Uh, these are not the same terms. Uh, Arab means somebody from the Arabian Peninsula. It's kind of an ethnic affiliation. And as an Arab, usually you are of the Muslim faith, but you could be an Arab Christian. Uh, you have some. A Muslim is a, a term that applies to uh, the faith that you have, that you're a follower of Islam and Muhammad and Allah. And you could be a Muslim of any background. Uh, here in the US, we have quite a few black Muslims of African descent. But you have Muslims that are not Arab, including the Turks, who originally are from a completely different area of the world. They would be part of those nomadic uh, groups from Central Asia. And, uh, they've actually migrated all the way to the peninsula of Anatolia, which is modern-day Turkey, a country that is named after those Turks. Uh, they settled in Central Anatolia in the 1200s, and they set up uh, what became later on the Ottoman Empire, the Empire of the Turks, and one that was very, very long-lasting, one of the longest-lasting in world history, because it was only uh, toppled by World War I, uh, in the aftermath of World War I in 1923. Actually, we have a couple of videos on the Ottoman Empire in World War I, and then reforms done by Mustafa Kemal after that in Turkey. Uh, so check those out if you want the end of the story. So the kind of uh, government that they set up uh, early on uh, would have been based on, well, nomadic warriors. Uh, meaning you have a ruler, uh, his name was a sultan, uh, who was an all-powerful figure, and also uh, had the judicial powers, uh, military powers, he would lead you in combat, as well as, he claimed, some religious powers as well. After the Turks converted to Islam, uh, the Ottoman ruler saw himself as the leader of the Ummah, the community of believers. So kind of a king and a pope uh, wrapped into one with no separation of church and state. Or an absolute monarch by divine right, if you want to use European categories. Uh, so is that an effective system of government or not? Uh, if you study uh, ancient Greece, somebody like, say, Plato, uh, he would have argued that something like a philosopher king, an enlightened dictator, would be the most effective form of government. Because uh, you have one person who is smart, he does things for the greater good, and by golly, he's going to do it fast because he's a dictator. There's no counterpowers, no messy politicking to be done the way you do in a democracy. The danger, however, and that has become clear uh, in many cases, is that uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's what Lord Acton liked to say. And so in the uh, 18th century, in the first part of the Enlightenment, uh, there was an, uh, an alternate route that was followed, uh, one of uh, democracy, uh, separation of powers, checks and balances, where you try to prevent one individual from being too powerful. Uh, instead, you have a divided government representative to the people. And sure, it's messy and it takes a long time to make decisions, but ultimately, uh, it's the safest way. Or as Winston Churchill liked to say, uh, democracy is the worst system with the exception of all the others. Uh, getting back to the Ottoman Empire, it's a good example of the, the pluses and minuses of enlightened dictatorship. Uh, early on in the empire, you have some uh, pretty effective rulers, 
uh, that tend to do quite well for the Ottoman Empire. And then as the quality of the leadership declined, uh, then the Ottoman Empire became the sick man of Europe. So early on, they did quite well. Uh, if you want to judge them by their military, it was quite effective up until the 1600s. The main uh, soldiers that they had in the army were called Janissaries. Strangely enough, they were slaves uh, that would be trained to be the elite soldiers of the Ottoman army. Typically, when you think of slaves, uh, the last thing you want to do is give them a gun. Uh, that might lead to revolt, but it worked quite well in the Muslim world. In fact, you also had Mamluks that were slaves employed in the army in Egypt, and that worked quite well there too. Uh, among their major victories uh, would be in 1453, the capture of the city of Istanbul, which is one of those fabled cities of Europe, goes all the way back to Emperor Constantine and last day of the Roman Empire, uh, when it was known as Constantinople. And then after the Roman Empire in the West collapsed, it survived as the capital of an Eastern Empire called the Byzantine Empire, uh, when the city was renamed Byzantium. And that empire lasted up until 1453. And what finally did it in, uh, the last tiny remnant of the Roman Empire would be a conquest by Mehmed, the Turkish version of Mohammed, uh, who then earned the nickname of Mehmed the Conqueror. The conquest uh, did not stop there. Uh, later conquerors also pushed into southeastern Europe, the Balkans, and the apex would be uh, reached under the rule of uh, Suleiman, that's the Turkish version of Solomon. Uh, who expanded into what would be today Libya and also uh, the Middle East and also into Europe, getting all the way to the edge of the great city of Vienna, which he besieged but failed to take. And for a while, it seemed as if the Ottomans were going to conquer all of Europe. Uh, for that reason, Solomon would be nicknamed the Magnificent. Uh, you don't want to judge civilization purely by how many people they kill and how many territories they conquer or how many people they enslave. Uh, instead, you want to also look at more positive things like feats of architecture. And there the Ottomans uh, were quite impressive, especially in the city of Istanbul, where they took up uh, all the heritage of the previous Roman and Greek occupiers and kept that. And so the Hagia Sophia, the great church of the Byzantines, became a mosque and now a museum. And then Suleiman built even more things, like the Suleimani Mosque, which resembles the Hagia Sophia very much. And then uh, you have some monuments that are of a more secular nature, uh, like the beautiful Top Kapi Palace. For uh, Turks, looking back on that period, uh, this would be a magnificent period, their golden age. And in fact, uh, in Turkish TV, if you're interested, there's a great series uh, called The Magnificent Century, which is one of these uh, period dramas uh, set in the time of uh, Suleiman the Magnificent. And you have a lot of backstabbing and intrigue and sex and violence. So, so far, everything goes well. So what went wrong after that? Well, it's inherent in the notion of enlightened dictatorship. You better have the enlightenment, otherwise uh, you have the dictatorship and that's it. And as the centuries went on, the quality of the leadership kind of declined, uh, partly due to the way uh, those dictators would be selected. Obviously, it's a dynasty, so they are ruled by blood, normally. It's the son of the previous ruler, a very male-dominated society, so you can leave the woman out of the picture. And out of that half male of humanity, how do you pick uh, who among the sons of the uh, emperor is going to be the next sultan? Well, it's a bit complicated because the uh, sultan emperors uh, would practice polygamy. Under the Quranic law, you're allowed to have up to four free wives, and then uh, concubines would be allowed without any specific quota because they're technically slaves. And so some of these sultans might have dozens or even hundreds of wives plus concubines who would be kept in the harem, the female-only portion of the pounds. So that might end up with dozens or even more uh, sons, each of whom could potentially be the next sultan. So imagine all the backstabbing that you have between various concubines and various half-brothers uh, trying to become the next sultan. And that could be quite bloody. Uh, in fact, it was pretty traditional that whenever uh, uh, one of these uh, half-brothers emerged as the rightful sultan, uh, he would uh, physically eliminate all his uh, brothers from another mother and then get rid of them. Uh, and that was accepted practice. So who do you, what is your mode of selection for the next ruler? Is it uh, election? Is it some mental IQ test? No, it's whoever is the worst bastard of the lot. Uh, he who has murdered all his brothers and half brothers. So that means that sometimes you're gonna end up with a ruler who might be pretty cruel and vicious and you have rulers later on in the Ottoman Empire with name like Ibrahim, nickname the crazy. Another problem for the uh, Ottomans uh, was not of their doing. Uh, it had to do with those Portuguese, who, uh, after Vasco da Gama in 1497-99, uh, were able to find a route to go from Portugal to India by sea through the southern coast of Africa, thus bypassing the Middle East altogether. 
And so an area of the world that had thrived through commerce before, because, well, they were the middlemen in the Silk Road, uh, now became kind of an afterthought, and that led to a long-term slump in the uh, area. On the other hand, you might say, why didn't they uh, think of uh, exploring the seas? Uh, there's also a failure on the part of the uh, Ottoman rulers as well. Beyond that, there's also a narrower and narrower interpretation of Islam. And there I have to tread carefully because all the matters pertaining to religion tend to be pretty uh, controversial today, especially when it comes to Islam. But I think there are a few points that need to be made there as to what went wrong uh, in the Ottoman Empire. And there's an interesting book about that if you want to explore that issue further. What went wrong in the Muslim world that uh, take, took them from a golden age to kind of an afterthought uh, on the world stage? As I said, a narrow interpretation of Islam is part of it. Uh, where you become so focused on religion that everything else, including science, tends to be frowned upon. Uh, the modern era is when printing came into being. And so you have an explosion of learning in, say, Europe, a scientific revolution, uh, and eventually the Enlightenment. At the same time, you have a restriction of thinking uh, in the Ottoman Empire, uh, because uh, printing was seen as a dangerous thing, that if you people know too much, it might challenge authority. Uh, so why don't we ban the printing of books? Or try to prevent people from printing any book except for the Qur'an, that this is the one and only book that you ever know because it has a truth in there. It's from Allah, it's from Muhammad, that's it. That's all you need. A new invention beyond the book uh, would be the uh, telescope. And so Italy, one man, Galileo Galilei, starts to point at the moon and the moons of Jupiter and then discovers interesting things that eventually are used by Isaac Newton uh, to develop all the theories of modern physics and, and gravity. And so at the same time that you have that scientific revolution, especially in astronomy in Europe, uh, in the case of the Middle East, because of the narrow interpretation of Islam, there is a tendency to prevent scientists from pointing the telescope at the stars or at the moon, uh, because then that would be blasphemy uh, towards the prophet or the creation of Allah, uh, that you are peeking into his backyard in the same way that you would be a peeping Tom with binoculars looking at your neighbor's bathroom. Uh, so that scientific revolution, the Enlightenment, completely bypassed uh, the Middle East in a way that was very damaging in the long run. So if you, uh, if you add up all of that, an area of the world that used to be quite dominant uh, now failed to update its weaponry, uh, enrich itself through commerce, or just go forward uh, in terms of its uh, intellectual developments, and you have a low, slow decline in what became known as a sick man of Europe, leading eventually to its collapse after World War I. Now, if you uh, kind of a fly over Iran and leave aside the Safavid Empire, the other big Muslim empire of the 15th, 16th, 1700s would have been the Mughals of India. Like many Muslim invaders or other invaders of India, they came from more from, more from Central Asia and then kind of swooped in through Afghanistan, the Khyber Pass, and into the plain of India below, where all those riches beckoned. Uh, the founder of the dynasty, uh, 1526, I think is the official date of the founding, uh, would be Babur, uh, the conqueror, and then you have a long line uh, that would last up until the 1750s. So what made the Mughal dynasty great early on and then not so great after that? Well, it's a story that's very, very similar to that we just studied in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, you have also a kind of king, or shah, as it would be called, uh, that would have absolute powers without any kind of powers, and if they're good, then you have an enlightened dictator. If they're not so good, then you might have another issue. What are the riches of India? Well, exploitation of uh, precious spices and textiles as well. Uh, for a while, India was the largest exporter of textiles in the world. Uh, not silk textiles, these would come from China, but more cotton-based textile. Cotton is a major crop of India. Uh, things like the beautiful Madras print, and I have one uh, right behind me on the Mr. ship. And these would be exported worldwide. In fact, uh, I'm from the Caribbean, and that's still part of the traditional way of dressing for women in the Caribbean, using those Madras textiles that originally came all the way from India. Or calico prints that were very, very in vogue uh, in the 18th century in Europe. Uh, so all these exports and jewels and other things would make India rich. The main question, though, for the, uh, uh, the uh, Mughals, if they wanted to remain in control of uh, the subcontinent of India, how do we get the population to like us? Uh, these would be Muslim conquerors. The vast majority of India is not Muslim. Uh, Hindu, some Buddhists, some Jains. Either you try to impose uh, your religion on the majority, thinking I'm Muslim, my face is the only true interpretation of the word of God, or you have a bit of cooler head and you think, uh, we're a small group of invaders, we can't uh, anger the whole population and, and by uh, turning against the gods. Uh, some of the early rulers, like say Akbar, tried to have a more 
tolerant policy of uh, maybe favoring Islam, but letting people worship uh, their Hindu temples if they wanted to, and allowed uh, the Hindus to be more willing to accept uh, rule by the Mughals and allowed some political stability. Aside from the achievements in the area of commerce and exploitation of textile, you also have achievements in terms of building stuff. And they're the more famous buildings that you have in northern India, like the Red Fort of Delhi, like the uh, great Taj Mahal in Agra. Uh, many of them date from the Mughal period. Uh, you're probably familiar with the uh, Taj Mahal, a beautiful piece of architecture dating to the reign of Shah Jahan, uh, who is best known uh, for being a polygamist, but having one wife that he loved more than the others. And unfortunately, she eventually passed away after delivering child number like 11 or 13. And then he was heartbroken and built uh, what is a tomb. What you're looking at when you look at the Taj Mahal is a tomb, or a fancy tomb, a mausoleum. The end of the life of Shah Jahan was not uh, the best. Uh, for one thing, he got into trouble with some of his Hindu population because he became more and more uh, intolerant toward non-Muslims as the years went on. Uh, also, he was overthrown by his son. And so poor Shah Jahan, he died fairly late, in, like in, in his 70s. Uh, he spent the last years of his life, you know, in a cell, looking through the window, uh, trying to sneak a peek of the Taj Mahal, uh, where his wife, beloved wife was buried. Uh, when he died, he did not get his own fancy mausoleum. Instead, he was buried right there in the Taj Mahal, along with his wife, but kind of tucked away in the corner, ruining the whole perfect symmetry of the building. Uh, Shah Jahan, when he had come to office, had killed a whole bunch of his brothers. Uh, same thing happened when his son, Aurangzeb, took office. And that gives you a sense of uh, the, system, uh, the problems that would emerge, similar to those in the uh, Ottoman dynasty of Turkey. So you might end up with people that are a bit too ruthless, a bit too intolerant, uh, which is exactly what happened. Uh, Aurangzeb pursued uh, the intolerant policies of his father and then expanded upon them to the point where, by the 1700s, quite a few uh, Hindus are starting to look elsewhere. Uh, for potential rulers and uh, trying to get upset or a revolt against the Mughal dynasty. Uh, which is uh, unfortunate because that's right the time when some foreigners are showing up. Uh, the Portuguese, the Dutch first, but eventually the French and the British are on the site. Uh, the French came up through a private trading company, it was called the Compagnie des Indes Orientales. Uh, the main agent of that company in the mid-1700s was a man called the Marquis de Duplay. On the British side, they had their own East India Company, called just that, the EIC. Uh, with uh, the main uh, agent in the mid-18th century being a man named Clive. And so each of those established uh, trading outposts, Madras, Bombay, Calcutta, Pondicherry for the French. Realizing how weak the Mughal dynasty was, especially in the southern part of India, figured, well, maybe let's hire some uh, mercenaries to protect our entrepôts, our ports. And then realizing how weak India was, they might expand into the countryside and then set up small kingdoms in the south, uh, which expanded and ultimately might control all of India because the Mughal dynasty was in steep decline. Uh, that eventually led into a major dispute between the French and British, known as the Seven Year War. And if you're American, you probably know of it as the French and Indian War. Uh, because from a British perspective in North America, you had those 13 colonies on the east coast of what is today the US. And as they tried to expand inland, they bumped into territories controlled by the French and their Indian allies. Uh, that's kind of a consequence of all these various colonial expansions that we've studied in various videos for that class. You also have conflicts in the Caribbean over the control of the sugar colonies. And you also have some naval battles along the coast of Africa, and these are more connected to the Atlantic slave trade and controlling uh, spots on the coast where you could embark some slaves. And there too, the British are prevailing. And then you have a fight over the textile trade, the spice trade from India. And there the fight is mostly those two private companies, the French and the British ones. Uh, with some major battles, like the Battle of Plassey in 1757, where there again, uh, the British emerged victorious. So when the dust settled and the Seven Year War was over, uh, this turned out to be a major triumph for the British, who had prevailed all over the world in what, to many scholars, could be considered the first world war, the first war fought on a global scale. Uh, that allowed them to expand in, uh, in North America, which is why eventually uh, Quebec is incorporated into uh, British Canada. Uh, how Louisiana is split, some of it going to uh, England, later the US, uh, the other one to Spain, later on the US as well. And that's so in India, the French had to relinquish most of their claims under the Treaty of Paris in 1763. And that's why eventually it was the British uh, who controlled India and toppled the Mughals. So to answer the question, how come the Ottoman Empire is not the one that ended up dominating the world, or same thing for the Mughal Empire, even though they started from a pretty strong standpoint, 
Uh, well, the answer might be human agency. Uh, we saw, and that's kind of a theory in the book by Bernard Lewis, what went wrong, uh, that the quality of leadership went down, uh, maybe because you're selecting your rulers based on how ruthless they are, and then you have a narrower, narrower interpretation of Islam that leads you to miss out on uh, great developments of the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution. If you're interested in that topic, another interesting answer would be provided by Paul Kennedy, a book that came out around 1990, as I recall, uh, called The Rise and Fall of Great Powers, where he also asked himself, well, how come for a while Athens was dominant in Rome and Carthage? Generally, the argument that he's made in that book is that uh, great powers initially they expand, uh, but as they get bigger, they become a bit complacent, and also you have a leadership that's too focused on self-preservation and has too many commitments all over the world, and out of the budget, more and more money goes to the military at the expense of anything else, such as education, science, and ultimately you sap the economic foundations of your empire, and at the end it collapsed in a way like, say, the Soviet Union did in the 1980s. And those ideas are not entirely new. One of my favorite U.S. presidents, Dwight D. Eisenhower, had a beautiful farewell address in which he warned about the rise of a military-industrial complex and how that could undermine the welfare of the United States in the long run. I'll let you ponder that and figure out whether these lessons might apply to maybe the great empire of today, the United States.